right, so, you know, it's the year of the Avengers, right? So we had to kind of give you guys an Avengers kind of open as we uh, get into the 23rd annual Detroit Athletic Club's Michigan High School Athlete of the Year Awards. And uh, before we begin, uh, just to get you guys in the spirit of the evening, I'd like everyone to give a round of applause for the entire DAC staff and everyone here who made this night so wonderful. I mean, it really is incredible. I know that uh, uh, every year I'm wowed by the, the lavish spread and, and just the hospitality and, and uh, just a really first class all the way. And uh, we're really excited to be here. For the first time in the show's history tonight, this event is being streamed live throughout the world. So we are very excited about that. My name is Lauren Plant, and it is truly my honor to be your MC this evening. I'm the executive producer of Yellow Flag Productions and host of State Champs High School Sports Show, uh, where we're celebrating 16 years. Uh, this is my uh, third year hosting these awards, and I believe that these are the most prestigious that a student athlete can win. And I say that because of the elements that go into the nomination. So athletics, academics, citizenship. We have here tonight in front of me uh, a true representation of the best our state has to offer. Each one of these young men and women have outstanding futures ahead of them. Uh, yes, thank you. Feel free to clap willingly at any time you feel like it. It's, uh, it's always good for the energy. Yeah, there you go. It's good for the energy in the room. Uh, every candidate received at least one letter of recommendation from school officials, coaches, teachers. Every letter you could tell just by reading them. There was a lot of uh, time and effort, a great deal of, uh, you know, detail uh, regarding each athlete's character, humility, their leadership. Uh, and again, we're going to do it one more time just because it's in my script and I want to hear it one more time. How about a hand, uh, put, putting your hands together to appreciate our 12 nominees for Michigan High School Athlete of the Year. All right, thank you. We've got a great evening ahead. Uh, we are going to punch in tonight because we're going to work as Big Ben Wallace is in the house. And we appreciate him being here. Of course, the former Detroit Piston, he's going to share a little of his journey on his way to becoming a world champion. But first, uh, this event would not be possible without the support of our sponsors who are committed to recognizing the achievements of these scholar athletes. So I just want to quickly name our sponsors and... Uh, Appreciate what they've done for us. Morgan Stanley, the three Bs, the Ruby McCoy Foundation, James Group International, the Robert and Mary Carey Foundation, Van Conway and Partners, WC Ducombe Company, Suite 618, Vince and Megan Brennan, Beverly Hall Burns, Bill McCoy, David Devine, or Devine, and L. Mason Capitani, and of course, President Tuxedo, who helped a lot of these gentlemen out. Uh, tonight. And just one real quick thing, this is kind of off script, but uh, I want to recognize uh, a couple of individuals that are here with us tonight. Uh, first off, because uh, we appreciate them so much being here, a lot of you know Peter Vanderkay, who is here, and of course Mike Martin, the uh, former Michigan Wolverine, Peter Van Vanderkay, an Olympic medalist swimmer. So welcome back. Uh, you are always welcome here uh, at the uh, DAC High School Athlete of the Year Awards. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the president of the number one athletic club in the country, the Detroit Athletic Club. Please welcome Mr. Jeffrey Gallinger. Thank you, Lauren. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege tonight to represent the over 5,000 members of the Detroit Athletic Club and our related charity, the DAC Foundation and to welcome you as we celebrate 12 incredible high school athletes for their amazing and inspirational accomplishments both on the field and off the field. Supporting amateur athletics is a long-standing tradition of the DAC. It was the basis of our formation in 1887. In fact, the DAC hosted the first national AAU track and field championships in 1888. Now, let's discover more about the athletic ex excellence of our club.
For 130 years, the DAC has produced numerous individual Olympic and national champion athletes, fielded championship sports teams, led the way in supporting Michigan's high school and college athletes, and remains a center for athletic competition, fitness programs, and a modern healthy lifestyle. Founded in 1887, the DAC was created by a group of dedicated young Detroiters caught up with the amateur athletics movement sweeping the nation after the Civil War. Striving to manifest the ideals of competition and brotherhood, they built a simple but elegant clubhouse and created an amazing athletic center along Woodward Avenue. The DAC's first president, Frank Eddy, played an important role in founding the Amateur Athletic Union and was instrumental in bringing the first national AAU track championships to the DAC. The club quickly became the hub of amateur athletics in Detroit, with championship teams and outstanding individual athletes. On the Cinder Oval, the DAC produced the Four Horsemen, a group of members who all held national track and field titles. Besides winning two national baseball championships in 1890 and 1892, the club also fielded one of the first organized football squads in Detroit, often playing collegiate teams, including the University of Michigan and Notre Dame. The DAC's field was so outstanding that U of M often hosted their home games at the club, drawing thousands of local fans. As a center of Detroit sports, DAC athletes tried many sports new to the country. They built an ice hockey rink and lawn tennis courts, later hosting men's and women's tournaments, they bowled, played handball, fenced, wrestled, and more. The DAC was renowned for its cricket and curling teams, boxing exhibitions, high wheel cycling races, and produced local, state, and regional championship basketball teams. And as Detroit evolved into a center for the auto business, members built a new clubhouse, which opened to great fanfare in April of 1915. The clubhouse featured extensive athletic facilities, including a natatorium, with a swimming pool on the fourth floor, a full-size gymnasium, squash and handball courts, and a fitness center. A sporting way of life continued with swimming competitions, squash, handball tournaments, and bowling leagues. Besides the many amateur athletic contributions, DAC members have long been involved with Detroit's professional sports teams. Prompted by Charlie Hughes, members of the DAC formed a consortium in the 1920s to buy the Victoria Cougars hockey team, and they became the Detroit Red Wings. Later, they built the iconic Olympia Stadium. In the 1930s, DAC members, led by G.A. Richards, purchased an Ohio football team and turned it into the Detroit Lions, winning an NFL championship within two years. Throughout its history, the Detroit Tigers have been owned and operated by DAC members, including three past club presidents, Walter Briggs, Frank Navin, and John Kelsey. Besides sports events and programs through the Beavers, the Bowlers, and the Black Ballers, today DAC members enjoy a fitness club, a rod and gun group, and scuba club. Members compete for club titles, enjoy annual golf outings, and take part in triathlons and city marathons. Each year, the DAC Foundation hosts the annual Chuck Davy Boxing Classic, featuring teams from the U.S. military, Air Force, and Naval Academies. And recently, the Foundation has become a leading sponsor of the newly created Detroit Cycling Championship. This USA Cycling sanctioned competition features pro and amateur riders racing through the streets of Detroit. The club's court facilities have hosted regional and national squash tournaments, and the bowlers continue one of the country's oldest competitions, the annual Interclub Tournament. To honor its amazing athletic traditions, the DAC Foundation created a series of monumental sports sculptures, sculptures of track and field, baseball, football, and swimming athletes, grace the street in front of the DAC and on its property. Today, the Detroit Athletic Club continues its important role in the community, enriching the lives of athletes and honoring its long-standing traditions of developing amateur and professional sports in the Motor City. Today, the DAC continues to organize, host, and support many athletic events and activities. 
One of the primary missions is our charity, the DAC Foundation, is to foster the advancement of amateur athletics. It is our pleasure to have with us tonight the longtime voice of the Detroit Pistons and MSU football, George Blaha and his wife, Mary. George, please stand. George has been a big part of these awards over the past years. It's great to welcome them back for another year, and we'll be honored to have you here for years to come. I also want to thank Lauren James, Rob Barr, Sean Moran, and Shannon Murray for all their hard work to make this, this evening possible. And a special thank you to Jane Jessick for all of her work behind the scenes. It certainly does not go unnoticed. It's now my pri privilege to welcome back Lauren Plant. Okay, how we feeling? Good? All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's meet the nominees for Michigan High School Female Athlete of the Year. Our first finalist is a record setter and a multiple dream teamer from Gross Point North High School. Let's meet Julia Ayrault. Julia Ayrault was born to play basketball. Whether it's a backyard game with her bro or competing at the highest level, everything she puts into it, she gets more in return. It's always been a part of my life and I think as time has gone on, I've learned like how much it's really done for me and how much like how many people you meet, how many like, you know, you build relationships from it. It's more than just like a game. So I think it's always been a good part of my life. So often, sports are about learning life lessons. It teaches you perspective. The games are the playoff for all the hard work that goes into it. It's pretty special when you have a coach and teammates that take you on your journey. Mr. Bennett, he prides it on our relationships with each other more than he does on kind of the basketball aspect. And if we lose, but we worked hard, he doesn't care. Like, he wants us to give it our all no matter what. And if we don't get the outcome we wanted, so be it. But at least we did everything we could. And I think that's taught me so much. There's more important things than, you know, winning or losing. Like, I'll never forget the relationships that we built and the team that we built and all that. Julia was a three-time first team All-Stater and a two-time Dream Teamer during her time with the Norsemen. She helped lead her team to the Division I Regional Final this season and was a Miss Basketball State Finalist. Julia is ranked the 14th top player in the country at the shooting guard position, and she leads by example. Just kind of bringing the energy and making sure people are, you know, into it and kind of realize that, yeah, we're all tired, but like, let's just, you know, we can get through it together and kind of keeping smiles on our faces and keep rolling with it. Julia is planning to attend Michigan State in the fall, and it was an easy decision for her to make. I think there were a lot of factors that played into it. I just think one of my big ones was definitely family, you know, being close to home and kind of being able to have my family at my games because since I was a kid, my family has always been at my games. And then going to practices at Michigan State and kind of seeing how the players interacted with not only each other but with the coaches, you could really tell that like they have a really good relationship similar to my high school coach and I knew that that was something I wanted to be a part of. Julia Ayrault, nominee for Female Athlete of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Julia Ayrault. Our second finalist was a National Player of the Year finalist, the reigning Miss Volleyball from Pontiac's Notre Dame Prep High School, Madeline Chin. We all have that certain attraction to the sport we love. 
Now there's passion, but for some, it's literally an extension of who they are. Who is Notre Dame Prep's Madeline Chin? One of the greatest volleyball players we've ever seen. She is the current Miss Volleyball, and it may have come as a surprise for her, but it wasn't for those who know her. It was crazy. I like At first I was in shock and I didn't know what was happening and then I realized it was all for me and just to see all my classmates and teachers and coaches um, there for me was incredible. The support um, that I've had all these years and in that moment felt so amazing and I'm so fortunate to have them. From day one, Maddie stepped up on the court at NDP. She raised the bar as a four-time All-American, three-time All-Stater. Maddie's record 624 kills and a .462 hitting percentage this season included a trip to the state finals. Notre Dame Prep were state champs in 2017, and her career numbers are nearly 2,500 kills, over 500 blocks, and 224 aces. She's the second player in MHSAA history to surpass both 2,400 kills and 500 blocks in her career. She will be the first to tell you that she has always depended on her teammates, and that means paying it forward. This year, we only had three seniors. So it was really important for us to teach the five freshmen that we had on varsity what we've been learning the past three, four years and implementing the Irish volleyball to them, especially when we leave so they can like carry that on for the program because it's before we got there it was amazing and so we wanted to keep it that way and like leave it when we left and they did a great job and we're really proud of like what we've accomplished this year. Maddie was a National Player of the Year finalist, but it should come as no surprise that academically, Maddie has maintained a high GPA while taking a very demanding course load. Maddie will take her talents to Purdue University, where she is continuing her volleyball career while studying pre-dentistry. I felt like Purdue was the perfect place for me because of the atmosphere that I could see when I watch practices or at games, whether it's between the coaches and the girls on the team. But what really stood out to me is like they carried that atmosphere and energy off the court as well. Outside of the classroom, Maddie made time to organize a volleyball clinic through the Special Olympics. Well, working with the Special Olympics, I get to share my passion with them and teach them a little bit more about it. So seeing like the smiles on their face when they would get a good pass or anything, like put a bigger smile on my face just to see that like I'm somehow like helping them in that way. Madeline Chen, nominee for Female Athlete of the Year. All right, if we got any Boilermakers in the house, you're getting a good one here, Madeline Chin. All right, our third finalist has racked up not only Dream Team honors, but multiple state championships as well from Birmingham Marion High School, Jansen Eichenlaw. The Bloomfield Hills Marion girls soccer team is unstoppable and it's led by the state's most dominant player, senior forward Jansen Eichenlaub. On varsity since her freshman year, she has helped the Mustangs win two consecutive Division II state titles. And for the first two years of her schooling, she juggled two sports in the same season, soccer and track. It was really hard struggling like the two sports, but I managed. I'd go right after school, I'd go to track practice and then I'd come home, eat my dinner and then my, I'd have to go to soccer and we'd have classroom and games and practice and it was, it was a lot to handle but it was fun. An example of multi-sports excellence was back in her freshman year. She ran two track relays finishing first and second at state finals, then drove three hours to the district soccer final where she scored two goals and tallied an assist. Amazing. Right as I was off the field, I was the fourth leg, then my parents were taking off my shoes, I was laying on the ground, I was so tired. <laughs> And then we drove straight to our soccer game and I was running on the field when the Pledge of Allegiance was playing. Jansen will be a two-time dream teamer and is one of the favorites to be Miss Soccer this season. A first team top drawer All-American, reigning Michigan Gatorade Soccer Player of the Year, she credits all of this to her coaches for pushing her to reach her full potential. They've definitely pushed me to who I am today. Like I've had Adam Gorski, he's definitely gonna want to shout out. <laughs> Um, we like practice every single day, all of my coaches, like they just want the best for me and they're really supportive of me. When it came down to picking a college, Jansen had a lot to choose from, but in the end she will take her talents to the University of Virginia. It took a lot to decide which school to get to, but I think just knowing how like, competitive everyone is at Virginia and how the girls can help me become like the best soccer player I can be, 
it's amazing just like to be on the team with everyone else. It's the top players in the country. A lot of them are doing great things, so it's an honor. Jansen also likes to give back to the community. One thing she takes pride in is her work with the Special Olympics, something she cherishes every time. I've worked with Special Olympics since freshman year, and basically we just go out and like help the kids play soccer, and we coach them or we ref them, and it's just really nice seeing the smiles on their faces and just how happy they are to be there. Jansen Eichenlab, nominee for Female Athlete of the Year. Let's keep it going for Jansen Eichenlab. Man, I'll tell you, already it's like a tough crowd to be. You know what I mean? It's like already these nominees are incredible, and it just keeps getting better. Uh, our uh, fourth finalist is a three-sport athlete, a multiple national champion from Detroit Country Day High School, Danielle Harchie. Detroit Country Day's Danielle, or more commonly known as Elle Harchie, is the definition of multi-talented. She excels on the tennis court, three-time individual and team state champion, ranked number one in the Midwest and top 30 in the country. Naturally, she's a Wendy's High School Heisman finalist. On the soccer field, All-State, Midwest Player of the Year runner-up, and how about on the ice? USA Hockey U18 Women's National Team, two years running national champion as a freshman and captain of another team that were national finalists just a year ago. There's just something about those Harchi genes. Her older sister and brother were also DAC Athlete of the Year nominees. A generational lineage of superior athletes means it's no surprise that Elle would follow in her family's footsteps. I would say some of it we were born with and some of it's a lot from our parents because they both played college sports and my dad played professional sports. So we've just been a sports family from the beginning. Elle's love of several sports is what drove her to try and do it all. Tennis, hockey, and soccer is quite the trifecta. Sounds stressful. However, she's got a rock solid support system. It's not easy, but sometimes, and sometimes it's hard, but it's, a, it's important to have a support group because sometimes I do get really stressed and you just have to keep a smile and keep moving forward, but I can have my parents or my sister or my brother. They're my best friends, so I have them to talk to and they've been through the same thing and they are my role models, so I know I can do it because they did it <laughs> and we're also very competitive, so I'm not gonna not do it because they did it. <laughs> Elle is one of the rare athletes that has already had the opportunity to don the stars and stripes. It's always been my dream to play on Team USA this summer when I actually made the national team. When I put the jersey on, it's you can't even describe the feeling of it. It's just so amazing. Although her options were many, Elle is going to continue her hockey career at Yale University. I just think it's a time to make my own path and do my own thing and get out in the world. When I went on that visit, I just knew. Like, it's the academics with the athletics and the atmosphere of the campus, everything I loved. Elle believes one of her greatest joys is giving back. Being the president of the organization Skate to be Great instills her passion in others. I just wanted everyone to have the chance to fall in love with hockey like I did. So we provide equipment if they don't have it, affordable ice time, free coaching, because I'm on the ice with them, helping them out. It just feels so good to be able to have people fall in love and I can see the smiles on their faces like I used to. Elle Harchie, nominee for Female Athlete of the Year. Being nominated as a rite of passage in her family, Elle Harchie. I'm trying not to make this embarrassing for you guys, uh, but I get excited. You know, why not? If you watch these videos, it's like blows you away. All right, ESPN ranks our fifth finalist, one of the top basketball players in the nation. She is Miss Basketball from Detroit Edison Public School Academy, Rakia Jackson. Detroit Edison High's Rakia Jackson will be the first to tell you that she is living the dream. Her smile will also tell you that. On the basketball court, there are those who consider her the greatest Michigan high school player of all time. This Miss Basketball is a multiple time dream teamer and ESPN ranks her the second best wing in the entire nation. She must have been born with a ball in her hands. Not true. Despite her parents' love and talent for the game, at first, Rakia wasn't about it. I thought it was like a boyish sport. Um, I thought it was like dirty. So my mom would be like, you wanna buy some basketball shorts? And I would say, no, that's nasty, that's for boys, and things like that. 
But once Rakia started playing, she not only embraced it, she fell in love with it. Her commitment is unprecedented. You know, early mornings, late nights, it just, it just takes everything. Um, many sacrifices, don't really get to see your friends and family a lot, but in the end, it's all worth it. Edison coach Monique Brown is more than just a mentor. She's really like a second mother. Oftentimes her toughest critic, most importantly, always available. She's the reason why I am the player I am today. You know, I can text her at 4 a.m. and gym, and she might say, are you crazy at first? But she will get up and open the gym for me. <laughs> Edison recently won their third straight state championship, and Rakia is a Naismith National Player of the Year nominee. One of her proudest moments was being named a McDonald's All-American. It felt great. Um, they definitely surprised me. I didn't know it was going to be as big as it was, but to be, you know, one of the only people from Michigan and the only person from Detroit to receive that is just a blessing in itself. Rakia will play at the next level at top-ranked Mississippi State, but also knows the importance of giving back. The Brown Bag Project is one of the things she is extremely passionate about. I gather my teammates and we go buy brown bags from a store. I take them over to the K-8 building and have them just draw positive messages, things like smiley faces and just quotes saying, you can do it and you will get through it. And you know, then we bag lunches and you know, we're just gonna pass them out to the homeless people and the less fortunate. So, you know, while they're eating their food, they can just, you know, smile a little. Rakia Jackson, nominee for Female Athlete of the Year. All right, some circles call her the GOAT, and I mean that in the greatest way possible, Rakia Jackson. Okay. At the last two Division I Swimming State Finals, it was her show. Our final female nominee is an All-American many times over from Farmington Hills Harrison High School, Ashley Turek. Farmington Hills Harrison's Ashley Turek is simply one of the best swimmers the state of Michigan has produced. Like most superstars, Ashley was bit by the water bug at an early age. In 2017, at the Division I state meet, this All-American was part of the mashup Farmington slash Harrison High Schools and broke the Michigan High School Division I record in the 50 freestyle and came within 45 tenths of a second of the 100 freestyle record. She won that race too, as well as setting the pace for the winning 200 free relay teams and anchored the win for the team in the 400 free relay. She was the Division I Swimmer of the Year. At the state meet last fall, she broke the 50 free record again in the prelims and then did it again in the final. She then broke the D1 100 free record in prelims and another state title. In the 200 free relay, she and her teammates broke another Division I record. The same foursome set the all-class and all-division record in the 400 free relay. This amount of excellence is earned. It's effort, it's exertion, every day. It's been a lot. It's definitely a lot of extra work needs to be put in and a lot of extra time that people don't usually see. It's hours a week in the water and then also out in the weight room. For me, it's trying to stay with it as much as I can because you have to put a lot of time into the sport. Farmington Harrison's class of 2019 is the final one. After 49 years, the school will close its doors. A member of the Student Council and National Honor Society, along with her swim legacy, it's a little bittersweet. It's really sad, especially because over these past four years, I've gained a lot of patriotism for my school. So like seeing it go and not being able to come back after everything that's been going on is a little bit tough. But it's really cool to represent the last class after 49 years. Ashley had a few college tours on her list before committing to Indiana University. But once she visited the campus, she knew it was home. I walked around the campus and it's beautiful there. And the team was really supportive and I kind of saw my team in them a little bit. So it was reassuring to see that there's other teams that are like willing to take you in and I just went there and I felt like I was so welcome and it was just where I needed to be and talking to the coaches they have really high hopes they don't view it as just taking people in just to make them better they really focus on who you are and what they want to build you as. Ashley Turek nominee for female athlete of the year. Well if Harrison's got to close its doors they certainly have a champion to go with it. Ashley Turek. All right. This is the time to catch your collective breaths. And I want to welcome up to the stage the nominees for the finalists for 2019 Female Athlete of the Year. Julia, you lead the way. 
and we can welcome them up. How about just one more round of applause for these amazing young ladies? There are no losers tonight. They are all winners, winners, winners. And their futures are all going to be absolutely astonishing. And we are thrilled to have them and represent in the mitten. So, okay, Jeff, the envelope, please. This year's Detroit Athletic Club 2019 Michigan Female High School Athlete of the Year is from Detroit Edison Public School Academy, Rakia Jackson. So, um, what do you think? Um, thank you, first off. You know, I would like to thank the committee for even presenting me with this award. And congratulations to everyone who made it here. Um, there are many people who love to be in our shoes. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> We've had the chance to talk a few times <laughs> yeah. this year, which has been uh, a real blast. Uh, you've won so many awards have had all these honors bestowed on you uh, and well-deserved. You were in some good company, obviously, with your fellow nominees. Um, because it's based just not on your, your talent, mm -hmm. um, but on academics, your leadership, community service, what does this mean to you? It just means a lot to see that my hard work. Okay. <laughs> it just means a lot to see that, you know, my hard work is paying off. Giving back to my community, that's one of the main things that I love to do because without them, I wouldn't be who I am today. Um, they're just such a great support system. So. Yeah. Who did you bring to the awards tonight? Um, I brought my mom, Coach Brown, and my little sister, Deja. Okay. Can you guys stand up? Because I think it's important to recognize <laughs> the support system. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I want you to talk about your support system, uh, especially, you know, your mom and Coach Brown, um, who you said is kind of like your second mom mm -hmm. uh, over these years. Uh, what they mean to you now that you're getting set to embark on the next stage of life? Um, they just mean a lot. And I'm going to repay them in many ways. I'm just trying to make them proud day by day. They sacrifice so much for me. And without them, I, wouldn't, I definitely won't be who I am today. It's important to have that perspective now. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you in our audience and uh, those watching at home, this is not only one of the top players in the country, uh, but loud and proud, pretty girl, you know, <laughs> uh, girly girl, if that's the term you want to use. Um, some have used the word diva, but I, I won't say that. Uh, no, seriously. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's important to you, like, you know, when you, when you go out on the court and mm -hmm. everything that you represent and that you, uh, you know, look and feel your best. Mm -hmm. it, why is that important to you? It's just important to me because that's how I grew up. I was always, I'm the only girl out right. of three boys. So I just always had to put on a tough face, but you know, deep, deep inside, I am a girly girl. So I just think um, it's very important to represent myself like that on the that's court. Right. All of it. Right? <laughs> 2019, we can be all of it. Um, you had a chance to uh, play with and against the best high school girls basketball players in the country at the recent McDonald's All American game in Atlanta. Uh, you led the West squad with 22 minutes played. Uh, you had 11 points, which was tied for most on your team, seven rebounds, a block, two steals. What was the whole experience like for you, and did you learn anything about yourself? Mm -hmm. It was definitely amazing to 
always play against people who are up there with you um you definitely get to match yourself up and see why you are ranked that high or you know your hard work is paying off um it was just a blessing to be able to be on that type of team yeah um you have an incredible opportunity in front of you now mississippi state it's a great program uh, you're going to be competing at a very high level what's the dream for you the dream for me, um, basketball college-wise, is to win a national championship, of course. Um, but long-term is just to become successful and remain successful. When did you stop thinking that uh, basketball was just a boys' game? And <laughs> you didn't want to have anything to do. When, when did that stop? Um, seventh grade year when I came to Detroit Edison. Um, I wasn't in love with basketball. I just liked it. And just to see, you know, offers rolling in and the recognition that I was getting around a state, I was just like, oh, I think I want to take this serious now. So, <laughs> um, I, I have to tell you guys, this one is as driven as like any player I've seen. Uh, when you watch her play, it's the skill set, you know, that really is so amazing. Uh, she's so hard to defend because if you give her space, she'll just sink jump shots if you press. <laughs> She'll blow right by you. Her ball skills are really, really impressive. Um, there would be times, I know late at night, that you felt uh, you had to work on something and you'd just basically pull out your phone and text what? Jim. <laughs> and that was to your phone. Yes. And it would be late at night, right? Yes. Oftentimes, and yet she would uh, uh, open the gym for you so you could, I mean, again, where does this drive come from now? Mm, I would have to say just trying to make my family proud. Basketball is something that my mom played and just to see the opportunities that it bring for my whole entire family, it just, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you and your teammates accomplished Definitely. at the high school level. Uh, three straight state championships. This year you guys moved up to Division Two, and you still crushed it. Um, how will you look back on your high school basketball career? I will look back as it it's, it was definitely fun. I would definitely miss high school, playing with those group of girls, you know, those are my sisters. We just all have such a tight-knit bond. So I would definitely miss them and they will always be my family. I think she was the only senior on the team this yeah. year. So Edison's gonna be good for years to come. <laughs> yeah. So gotta look out for that. Um, you had offers from some of the greatest women's college basketball programs from all over the country, yet you chose uh, Mississippi State, why? Because the realness, um, Visiting each school, I, I can read through people a lot, and Mississippi State seemed to not just sell me a dream. They were just like, you're, you're going to have to work to be on this court. Everyone else is just like, um, you know, you, you can come here and start, but I want to know the real, the real you. And just the amazing campus, it's just so beautiful, and the players, I just, I saw myself meshing with them so well, and I was only there for about two days, so... Yeah, maybe so comfortable. Really thought now about moving forward, like what is your ultimate dream? What do you want? You don't uh, have to know. It. <laughs> I didn't know it. Um, just be successful, whatever I do. Okay. Fair enough. We're better for it. So, Rikia Jackson. <laughs> Thank you. Put your Thank hands you. together. All right. 2019. Okay. Yep. That's it. That's it. You can take this too. Okay, before we uh, introduce our nominees for High School Male Athlete of the Year, we have a very special guest with us tonight. I'm ex really excited for her. He was as dominant as a defensive big man as humanly possible. He played nine of his 16 NBA seasons with your Detroit Pistons, a four-time NBA Defensive Player of the Year. He also led the league in rebounds twice and once for block shots a four-time NBA All-Star, and of course, a key cog in the Pistons' run to the 2004 NBA Championship. Check out this fierce flashback. Fans just love the efforts, but how about the rising ability 
off of Ben Wallace. Detroit ends it on a high note, and then they just add exclamation point after exclamation point. That guy's the Wallace. Soccer pass and a hard dunk. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes, we really appreciate it. Um, I have notes. And uh, it's, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your journey. Uh, and again, we're celebrating these you know, amazing young athletes who have an amazing future ahead of them uh, very quickly. Uh, and whatever it was that for you that drove you uh, to never give up. But first, there were so many of us that loved the Pistons bad boy era and for obvious reasons. Uh, but I'll tell you, the mid to late 90s era, we call the, or at least a lot of us call it the horsehead era. Uh, it was rough. It was rough here. And uh, you only played one season in Orlando before you were traded to the Pistons, along with Chucky Atkins for Grant Hill. Joe Dumars' first season as general manager, you guys only won a 32 games, but in 0102, you guys win 50 games. Uh, the team went back to the red, white, and blue, which was awesome. Uh, your game was improving every year, but now you're defensive player of the year, you know, right away. Uh, and you would earn that honor three more times. There are so many professional players that can't reach another level after they've been there already for a few years. Um, how did you? Oh, man. Sorry. I've been wanting to ask uh, it for so long. Um, I had a certain love and a certain passion for the game. But um, early in my life, you know, um, you know, as professional athletes right now, we talk about who put that battery in your back, who wind you up and set you on your life path. My mom wind me up and put me on my life path when I was about 16 years old. You know, um, she saw something in me that she didn't see in the rest of, in the rest of her other 10 kids. And, you know, she made me believe that I was different than all the rest of my siblings and also that I was different than any other person she ever met in her life. So she, um, she put the basketball in my hand and say, I hope this basketball, football, baseball, track and field, something gonna work out for you because if it don't, I'm probably gonna have to live forever to take care of you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so she told me she didn't see me working a nine to five job. She said, there's something special about you and I think you're the one. And you know, I wasn't the tallest sibling, I wasn't the biggest sibling. You know, I had a brother that was seven feet, I had a brother that was 6'10", and um, you know, I ranked third at 6'8", six, 6'9", six, and you know, right. I had, three sisters that was six feet, six two, six one, you know, so I was the runner of the family, but. <laughs> so, right. And you know, my mom was six four, so she made me believe I was that much special than anybody she ever met. And when she put me on my life path, you know, um, coming from where I came from, you know, I don't know how many people, how many people up here are familiar with Lowndes County, Alabama, yeah, not many. Anybody? Yeah, 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 <laughs> shout out. Well, well Lowndes County is a small town, man, and, you know, we got, a, we got a rich, rich history down there. You know, a lot of people don't know about us. You know, I'm writing a book right now to make it public so, you know, everybody can know about, you know, our history. Yeah. You know, um, and coming from Lowndes County, Alabama, she just made me believe I was that, I was special, I was better, and I was more talented, and I had more drive than anybody I ever faced. And with her having my back, you know, I know I, I knew that um, I had the world at my hands. So I just went for it night in and night out. And the crazy thing about my mom is my mom never seen me play football, basketball, baseball or anything until my rookie year in the NBA. Wow. So she had that vision. Yeah. So that was my drive. That was my heart. That was my battery. That was my wind up gear. And I did it all for her. You were the 10th the of 11 kids right? Uh, I can only imagine that household must have been chaos. Uh, how, how, can you even describe it? How did you get through it? Oh, man, I had to fight. You know, yeah, <laughs> fight. You know, 
You had to fight for yeah. everything, you yeah. know. I couldn't, you know, I had to fight for, you know, scraps, you know, leftovers, <laughs> hand-me-downs. You know, I had to fight to get out the house. I had to fight to play basketball, even when, you know, everybody figured out that I was the best player on the court. But they was bigger and they was older. So I still had to fight. And even to this day, when I go home, out of everything I accomplished, I'm still not the best player in the family for some reason. So, so I'm still fighting. Okay, all right. Uh, what a, pop, a lot of people probably know, you were all state in basketball, baseball, and you were a linebacker in football, right? Uh, but then you, you took an interesting route to the NBA. So first you go to community college in Cleveland. How did you end up there? Um, well, basketball was not my first choice. Basketball was not my first sport. You know, football was my love. Football was my passion. You know, growing up with um, with seven older brothers, you know, there's a lot of contact in the house. <laughs> so, so I fell in love with football. Right. So, football was my first choice. Football was my passion. You know, I still love football to this, to this day. You know, um, I always thought basketball players was soft. <laughs> say, say that's you know what I mean that's that's not me these guys are soft and um, my senior year in high school you know um, I hurt my neck in football I pinched a nerve in my neck in football and um, the doctors told me I wasn't gonna be able to play football you know past high school and we had three more games left in the season so my next question was what well, can I finish my high school season and they was like probably not so I went home and talked to my mom and she was like, well, if, what you really, if it's what you really want to do, you know, I, want, I don't want to stop you from doing that, but you know you can't hurt yourself. Right. So I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. So I finished my, you know, last three games of my football career and realized that I wasn't going to be able to go any further playing football. So I put all my energy into basketball, you know, having one season to fully focus on basketball, you know, my senior year. You know, I didn't really think it was going to come to tuition. So I knew I was going to have to take a different route. So my junior year, going into my junior year, I, you know, I earned some money cutting hair and, um, you know, installing car stereos, you know. So I, I earned enough money to go to Charles Oakley was having a basketball camp in um, Lowndes County and, his, and, um, and I went to his camp. And I met him and I met one of his um, friends who was coaching at this um, community college. So they gave me their numbers and told me to keep in touch. If I ever want to go to college, you know, give them a call. And I was like, you know, um, how's your football team? And they was like, we don't have a football team. I was like, oh, well, I can't talk to them. <laughs> but after I hurt my neck and after my senior year basketball, I might have had, I had a couple of, you know, offers, Alabama State, Mississippi Valley. And, uh, but, you know, I wanted to get away from Alabama. And I wanted to get away from Mississippi because I feel like they are the same state. <laughs> you know, they just on different pages of the book. So, you know, being a, growing up in the country all my life, you know, I had saw enough cotton, corn, and, you know, watermelon and all that stuff. I was like, I want to go to the city. So I called up the coach and he said he had a scholarship for me to come to Cleveland. And, um, you know, I went up there and yeah. gave it a shot. Yeah. So he's talking about uh, former New York Nick Charles Oakley, who was, uh, you know, again, great player in his day. Uh, what was your first winter like? Oh, my God. I mean, me leaving Alabama in September, going to Cleveland, Ohio in September, like, you know, me going from, yeah. you know, 90, 95 degrees to, to in two days being in Cleveland, snow. So I was like... <laughs> So, you know, I called my mom. I was like, I think we made the wrong, yeah. wrong choice. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, like she always did, she refused to let me come back home. She was like, no, you made the decision. You're going to stick with it, and you're going to make the most of it. Right. And, you know, I tried everything I could to get back to Alabama. Like, you know, I missed, <laughs> missed a couple of classes, you know, skipped a couple of practice, got in a fight with a couple of coaches. And my mom was like, nope, I know what you're trying to do. You're going to stay. So... I had to go apologize to those people and figure out how it's going to stay. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, it's, it's a remarkable journey, you know, and this is, this such is life. You know, decisions you make, it, you know, you would have, could have been completely different. Uh, but here you are. You were then able to transfer to Division II Virginia Union, 
Uh, you were a D2 first team All-American there. Um, what was that experience like? And because obviously you had a, a good you know, a good amount of success. Did you think that you might get drafted? Oh, man. Um, leaving Tri-C, Calhoun Community College, you know, we call it 3C in Cleveland. Um, leaving Tri-C, I had become one of the, you know, top two-year players in the country. And, you know, I had all the big schools calling, but, you know, I was a little intimidated by the big school campus. You know, coming from a small town in Lowndes County where we only had one flashing light, four stop signs. So I look at these college campuses, I said, they're bigger than my whole community. So <laughs> yeah. this, this, this is just not me. Right. So when I went to Virginia Union, you know, right away from the time I stepped on campus, you know, I, I can see all the way across campus. I say, this is a place for me. So, you know, going there, had a decent career, you know, became Division II, you know, All-American or whatever. And um, I didn't think I was going to get drafted. But I thought I would have an opportunity, you know, to try out for a team. But to my surprise, it was a couple of teams that called and said, that if I was going to be around late second round, that they was going to draft me. I mean, of course I'm going to be around late second round. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know if, how many of y'all are familiar with the class of the draft class of 96. I'm like, Ben Wallace don't look to get it drafted in 96. So, you know, they say it was going to draft me, but a couple other players dropped. So that knocked me out of the draft. So I didn't get drafted. And, um, you know, I got a, got a couple of calls to come try out. And, you know, one of the teams that called me to come try out was was Boston, the Celtics. So I was excited. I know the history of the Celtics. I was excited to go there. And, you know, I walk in there. I'm like, you know, Celtics had some of these, some good big men out there, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, and those guys. I say, so, you know, I can try to pick that torch up and keep it going. But I get to Boston, and to my surprise, Boston not looking for a center. Boston looking for a shooting guard. So, so they got me playing the two and the three. I'm like, I'm like, it's not me. And you know, they was like, if you want to play in this league, you're gonna have to play the two or the three. Virtually told me I was too small to play the center power forward. And um, so, I worked out for a couple of weeks, played in the summer league or whatever. But I, my heart really wasn't into it because, you know, I. I'm not a shooter. I know I'm not a shooting guard. I know I'm not a three, you know. I think basketball players are soft, and I really think those positions are super soft. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, so I was like, you got to put me in the paint. I'm going to need to hit somebody, you know what I mean? I didn't knock somebody down so I can feel like I'm a part of the game. So, so that didn't work out. So, and you went to Italy, right? So I leave there and go to Italy. I was in Italy for for about a month. And then um, what at that time, you know, it was the Washington Bullets. Yeah, the Bullets. So Wes Unsell called and was like, uh, we're looking for, you know, we're looking to fill our roster for veteran camp. And I say, I say, Wes, I'm not an NBA player. I said, I didn't try that with Boston. I'm not a two, I'm not a three. You know, I'm a four or five. So I'm not coming back to be y'all practice dummy. And, um, and he was like, he was like, okay, you know, this is your opportunity. I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I said, my goal was to play professional basketball. And now I'm in Italy and I'm playing professional basketball. I said, so I'm gonna stick with it. So he called me a second time. I said, Wes, we've been over this before. And he called me a third time. I said, Wes, I'm doing pretty good here. He say, but it's something you said the first time we talked, and you said that you was playing the two or the three. He said, what idiot put you at the two or the three? He said, <laughs> he said, he said you was a 30% free throw shooter, so I know you can't make jump shots. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Wes told me, he was like, you know, being an under, undersized center myself, you know, I know what it takes, you know, for you to feel like you're part of the game. He said, I'm looking for a center, or power forward. He's about more than all, I'm looking for somebody who can defend and knock somebody on their butt. I said, okay, I'm your man, I'll be back. All right. So he came back, uh, a few years later, you wind up in Detroit, 
And again, like I mentioned at the beginning, didn't start out great, but did you feel that something was happening, something was changing? I mean, when I came to Detroit, you know, um, first I ended up playing three years, making that Washington team. Right. Was, was the last rookie to play for the Washington Bullets before they changed the name to the Wizards. Right. Then ended up getting trades from Orlando, where I got an opportunity to start. Yeah. You know, in Washington, I was sort of against the numbers. You know, we had um, a couple people that y'all might know, you know, Chris Weddle, Jawan Howard, you know, they got four to five locked down. So, so I had to play behind them yeah. and wasn't, no, wasn't much time behind them. Right. So I ended up getting traded to Orlando and I get traded to Orlando. Orlando is rebuilding. And it's Doc Rivers first year, you know, as the coach. And um, in our first team meeting, you know, he said, he stood up and told the whole team was like, you know, the only thing I have to say is nobody on this team is guaranteed a position. If you want to play, you got to earn it. And I thought, you know, those are, those are the best words I heard since I've been playing NBA basketball. And he rolled the ball out and we went for it. So I ended up winning the, the, um, the center spot, ended up starting at the center. Had a pretty decent season. And end of the season, you know, Orlando wanted to go a different a different direction. And um, and I was just remembering like, like where I'm going from here. Like Orlando, you know, it's sort of like Alabama. Like right now it's, it's 85, 90 degrees year round. <laughs> so, so it's going to be tough for me to leave. And um, and I got the call, you know, wasn't even thinking of, you know, Detroit Pistons. You know, I got the call. So all I know, you know, uh, uh, my wife, you know, Sean at the time was like, uh, Joe Dumas is on the phone. I was like, man, stop playing. She was like, yeah, from the, from the Pistons. I was like, it don't matter where, where he's from. I said, if Joe Dumas is calling you, I said, we... We we in there now, yeah. you know what I mean? We yeah. we'd have made it. So um so he was like, you know, we working up the scenario where we're gonna, you know, try to get you in a trade for for Grant Hill. So now I'm now I'm really surprised. Like I know I know who Grant Hill is, mm -hmm. but I know Grant Hill don't know who Ben Wallace is. <laughs> so so <laughs> so this is the trade that you about to put me in. You about right. to put me in for one of the, you know, the league best players, you know, um, so I'm like, the expectation is going to be pretty high. So, and then I read the paper after they, they make the trade, and it says one of the most one-sided, the most one-sided trade in NBA history. <laughs> so I'm like, Grant Hill got the short end of that stick, huh? <laughs> yes. But, but coming to Detroit with no expectation, you know, um, franchise you losing a player like Grant Hill, and, and I'm coming in, you know, of course, the pe people in the organization, you know, coaches, GM, owners, you know, presidents, you know, they know who I am. They know what I represent and what I stand for. But, but the fans don't. So just coming into that arena with, with no expectation, you know, nobody saying that I was about to be great or the next this or that type of player, you know, it helped me to relax. Now I can go out and play my game. Now I can show the world who I am. That season, that first season didn't go well, didn't go well at all. You know, we, the team sucked. <laughs> but, but I felt good because I had found a home and they turned over the keys to me. It was, you know, they said, this is your team. This team is gonna go as you go. And that was one of the most awesome feelings that I ever felt, you know, um, in playing this game. So I took it upon myself to, you know, will myself and will my team to go out there and, and have some success. Yes, it was amazing. Um, just quickly, I'm having a great time here. Uh, flash forward to 2004, of course. Uh, believe it or not, our nominees here were practically toddlers. <laughs> you can believe that. Um, you guys had made the conference finals the year before, and then Rick Carlisle's out, you know, which of course stunned everybody. Larry Brown is in. Um, they say if Rasheed Wallace doesn't come to the team late in the season, you don't win the title. However, that team was killing it before he got there. And I think you get the, I think you guys win the title even if Rasheed Wallace is not on the team. Yeah, I said it. I'm proud, I'm proud to own that. Uh, so many in this room have such a 
deep affection for that team and what it represented to the city. You know, a city that was now finally starting to have a renaissance. Uh, we may have not seen anything like it since in professional sports. Uh, how and why did it work in your estimation? Um, the reason it worked was because it didn't work for it didn't work for uh, the majority of the guys on that team early. We didn't have an easy path. You know, I had to start my route at community college, division two, undrafted, had to make a team. You know, uh, she was uh, drafted by Washington, then traded to Portland, then traded to Atlanta, traded to Atlanta, then traded to Detroit. Chauncey was drafted, gave up on in Boston, Denver, went to Minnesota, then came to Detroit. Rip was drafted in Washington by, you know, the best player that ever played the game by Jordan, yeah. and then was told that he wasn't the type of player that he was looking for. Yeah. And, um, you know, Tayshawn was one of the guys that was drafted by Detroit, but had to sit the bench for a whole year, you know, because they say he wasn't ready to play. So eventually when we was all ready to play, we didn't feel like anybody gave us anything. We felt like we earned everything that we got. And we felt like people was giving us the credit that we deserve. You know, you hear surrounding that team that we was a team without superstars. So I don't know what the definition of a superstar is, you know, with that team, you know, cause in our own right, we was all superstars. And we always said that we're the definition of what a team of superstars look like when you play together as a team. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. Believe that. Believe that. Um, just a couple more real quick. Uh, we are uh, blessed again to have George Blaha here again with us uh, tonight. Uh, he's been calling Pistons games since they played at Cobo Arena. Herb Brown was coach. Bob Lanier was uh, in your role uh, for the team back then. Um, again, you know, it's always great. And, you know, he, he was in that whole run with you guys as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's always great to, you know, see George, man. He was, you know, he was awesome calling the games. And um, we, we all enjoyed hearing him call the game. I think it was like the, usually when I watch breakdown films, I turn the volume off. You know, because I don't want to hear what the announcers and, and everybody else got to say. I just want to see what's going on on the floor. Mm -hmm. But with George Blaha, you know, um, count that baby in a file. Right. You know, <laughs> we all wanted to hear that. So we, we definitely listened to the commentator when he was doing it. And, um, you know, I just a great guy, you know, um, him and his wife. You know, every time I've been honored, you know, here in the state of Michigan, they always been there to support me, man. And, um, you know, just couldn't think of two, you know, um, better people to, um, to be associated with. Yes. So. Okay. Absolutely. So much love in this building tonight. Uh, all right. Every one of these super student athletes down here are getting a chance to compete in their sport at a major university. Some have professional aspirations, uh, whether it's perhaps Olympics, maybe, or something else. Um, your journey, obviously, we know was very different, yet you persevered. Uh, what advice do you give them as they say goodbye to high school and now enter collegiate athletics? Um, life about to take off. Life is about to get fast. Pace is about to change. But, you know, just look, looking at you guys and, and hearing y'all's stories and seeing some of y'all's accomplishment thus far, you know, I, I want you to always thank and, um, and remember to uh, be your own fan, cheer for yourself, believe in yourself, because you're gonna run into some people, you know, at one moment they're gonna tell you how great you're gonna be. Then they're gonna look at the next person that's standing beside you and tell them how great they're gonna be. Right. So they're gonna put you on a level, a level playing field. So don't be afraid. I think it's, I think a lot of time we get caught up in the fact that that is kind of 
taboo to cheer for yourself, to be your own fan. You got to be your biggest and greatest fan. You got to believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, then you can achieve it. If you don't believe in yourself, then you're right. Whichever way you go. If you believe you can do it, you're right. If you don't believe you can do it, then you're right. So cheer for yourself. Be your own fan. Take control of your own destiny. And when one thing I always said, I took a long journey. I could have went the short route. I could have changed some things. But it was my life. It was my journey. And I lived it. And I did it my way because at the end of the day, you trying to please everybody else, it's not going to work. You got to do what makes you feel good about yourself. You got to look at yourself every day in that mirror, and you got to be happy with yourself. So don't pay too much attention what the naysayers say, but they're going to say some things. And you can listen, but use it as motivation because you are your biggest fan. Always cheer for yourself. Heart, motivation, dedication comes from you, starts with you, end with you. No matter how much my mom believed and pushed it, pushed me to do things, if I, did, if I never believed in myself, I never could have gotten this far. So be fans of yourself. Everybody in this room, all big fans of you guys. So. Okay, last question. Um, for those of us who don't know what Ben Wallace is doing these days, what are you doing? Oh, man. Um, I'm, I'm setting my own schedule, you know, I'm, uh, I'm blazing a different path. You know, my NBA career is over and I think I had a great career, but my life is just starting. So I'm not only a retired athlete anymore, you know, I'm a husband, I'm a father and more important to me, I'm a businessman. So I'm opening up that next chapter of my life and I wanna be just as successful in the business world as I was on the basketball court. So I'm currently one of the owners of the Pistons G League team, the Grand Rapid Drive, you know, um, and people ask me about, about the G League. I say, had the G League been around when I first came into this league, I definitely would have made a stop in the G League. Right. So now it's just all about, for me, the pride I take in being a G League owner is keeping dreams alive. I meet these kids and I see them passionate about making it to the next level. And I've taken it upon myself, you know, to give them the knowledge and wisdom and the skills to make that to that next level. Keeping their dreams alive, giving me the more, giving me more, you know, excitement and more joy right now and you know in my life is being able to affect and change other people's life. So we keeping dreams alive in the G mm. League. The Detroit Pistons all-time leader in blocks, all-time playoff leader in rebounds. His number three is retired and we thank Ben Wallace for so generously sharing some time with us tonight. Ben Wallace, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Ben Wallace, everybody. Thank you. All right. You guys having a good time tonight? I know I am. Good. Okay. Let's bring it back down. It's time now to meet the nominees for Michigan Male Student Athlete of the Year. Our first finalist is a three-sport athlete. He's a multiple state champ. Bottom line, he's got skills. From Kalamazoo Hackett Prep High School, Heath Baldwin. It's not uncommon to see high school athletes playing multiple sports, but Kalamazoo Hackett Catholic Prep's Heath Baldwin 
took it a step further playing four sports in high school, baseball, basketball, football, and track and field. Winning accolades in all four, he was all-conference in basketball and baseball and all-state in his junior and senior season in football. But he's bread and butter is track and field, all-state in the long jump and won 10 hurdles between his sophomore and senior year, all-state in the 300 hurdles his sophomore year. As a junior, raced his way to a state championship in the 110 hurdles and the long jump, respectively. My track coach, Coach Chalamides, really taught me a lot about hard work and what it takes to get to the next level. What do you have to do? It's more of an obsession now. You kind of get obsessed with, just want to be the best. I want to reach my potential. Athletes all over the world use their platform to give back. Heath is no different. He's on the student leadership team at school, helping incoming freshmen transition to high school. He also spends time at the Kalamazoo Valley Children's Museum, where he creates crafts with kids. I did crafts tables with them, and I just really enjoyed being around the kids and spending time with them. It was something that I actually liked. A member of the National Honor Society, Heath is also on the Student Athletic Advisory Board at school. But a new challenge is on the horizon track and field for the University of Michigan. He's looking forward to the new challenges that come with being a college athlete. So I'm going to have to learn how to do the, all the events in the decathlon for next year. So that'll be a challenge, but I'm, I'm very excited. When it's all said and done, Heath dreams big. See where sports take me. I'm not going to rely on anything in track and field, but maybe if I start developing rapidly, the Olympics would maybe be something we can dream it, but we'll, yeah, we'll see what happens. Heath Baldwin, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. Heath, please stand and be recognized. Heath Baldwin. All right, our second finalist threw the most touchdowns in the state all time in a single season and the third most touchdowns in the country. And he'll play two sports in college from Madison Heights, Madison High School, Austin Brown. There's a famous saying by Mark Twain. It's not about the size of the dog, but the fight in the dog. When it comes to Madison Heights, Madison's Austin Brown, he has shown the fight throughout his high school career, achieving a great number of accomplishments, including Division Seven Player of the Year in football and first team All-State in basketball and football. The football team made the state finals for the first time in 13 years. I wasn't blessed with a 6'5 frame. I wasn't blessed with the best, the most athleticism. I mean, I, I, had to, I had to grind. I mean, I had to do stuff that not a lot of high school athletes had to do. I mean, I had to wake up, like I said, I gotta wake up 6 a.m. some days to get that work. Austin recorded the second most points in the country in 2018, third most touchdowns nationally. His 61 TDs are the single season record for most all time in the state of Michigan. Competitor is Austin's middle name. Just so happens his father is athletic director at Madison, who was a heck of an athlete for the Eagles back in his day. His pop was quite the legend, at least until Austin showed up. He, he had the state record at, uh, at Madison for touchdowns for a while, and then it was recently broke by DeAndre Johnson, and then I ended up taking it, taking it back over and putting the brown, brown name back on it. But I mean, when I talk to everybody, especially around my city, and even, even beyond that, it's kind of like, yeah, your dad ran, ran like a buzz. With all that Austin has accomplished on the field, giving back to the community is also high on his list. He volunteers at the food bank, reads to kids because it's important to him that they have role models. It doesn't stop there. His competitive nature carried into the classroom a 4.0 GPA and a member of the National Honor Society. Yeah, I don't want to be outdone by anybody, whether it's in the classroom, like if I get an A minus, someone gets an A, I'm, I'm, I'm mad about it. Like I want to get that A plus. I want to be, I want to be the best. Dual sport athletes are becoming more and more common at the next level. Originally, Austin had agreed to play baseball at Marshall. After his phenomenal season on the gridiron, Grand Valley offered a football and baseball scholarship. I'd say it's a tremendous challenge that most probably couldn't pull off. But for Austin, he's got this. And they were pretty excited about me and they were kind of like really they they wanted me and they were like hey man what do we got to do to get you here and i was like well 
Uh, my dad really, my dad and my grandpa really want me to play baseball. I mean, I, I wanted to play, I want to play baseball too, don't get me wrong, but like something to make them happy and myself happy and kind of just not really close any of the doors just yet. So they were like, all right, well, we can make that work. Austin Brown, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. All right, let us congratulate Austin Brown. All right, our third finalist was our People's Champion for this year's State Champs Anvil Award, a U.S. Army All-American from West Bloomfield High School, Lance Dixon. West Bloomfield's Lance Dixon will be remembered as one of Michigan's toughest linebackers. Not only did this five-star masher make both first-team All-State and the football dream team his junior and senior seasons, Lance garnered the most votes in the first ever State Champs Anvil Award competition, which recognizes the top linemen or linebackers in the state of Michigan. His over 6,000 votes were twice as many as second place. On the track, All-State his junior year. And Lance isn't just a game changer on the field. Involved in a mentorship program at West Bloomfield, reworked with kids within the city. A full football scholarship to Penn State University, Lance enrolled in January. So what's that transition been like? Still 17 and you know, playing against like 24 year old men, so it's like, it's a big difference. So you just know, you gotta know your place, you know, and you know the other guys will understand where you're coming from because they just a couple years ago in the same position as you. Most sport teams have a captain, someone who rallies everyone together, especially in crunch time. Legacies are created in these moments. With Penn State head coach James Franklin in attendance, Lance auditioned for the role in the Division I District Finals versus Catholic Central. He scored the game-winning touchdown in overtime. When the overtime started, I was telling my teammates, like, I'm, I'm made for this. Like, y'all go see me now. Like, I'm, I'm built for this, like, just to, just to win, you know. I mean, I always want to win. Scoring that touchdown, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good moment for me. And just having Coach Franklin there, Definitely was a big bonus. The U.S. Army All-American football game features some of the country's best players. It's the home of Hall of Famers, Heisman winners, and numerous NFLers. Lance was named to the team, and he excelled in San Antonio. Great experience, you know, just going to see Riverwalk and seeing, like, the foods they had out there just was not even about football. It was just, like, about life experiences. You know, it was a great experience, but the game and practice, you know, you just see Everybody out there is good. Good luck with the Nittany Lions. Lance Dixon, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. He's taking a quick break from linebacker U to be with us tonight. Please stand and recognize Lance Dixon. All right, our fourth finalist has numerous state titles in cross country and on the track. He is the reigning two-mile national champion from Ann Arbor Pioneer High School, Nick Foster. Ann Arbor Pioneer's Nick Foster has run himself into the history books. A seven-time All-Stater, two-time Gatorade Runner of the Year the reigning two-mile national champion, numerous state titles under his belt. Mr. Cross Country needed some seasoning, however, to get where he is. I ran a cross country race at the, in my freshman year after soccer season, I just came to a race. I was wearing some old beat up shoes. I didn't have spikes or anything. I was like, oh, I'll go do this. We'll see how it is. And I remember just, as a mile in, I was just like, geez, this is hard. Although Nick has accomplished a lot in his young career, he soon realized that life is more than just cross country and track and field. In the classroom, Nick stays near the top of his class with a 3.9 GPA. He's volunteered and coached for the Special Olympics, as well as peer connections at his school. My sophomore year, I, it was a class called Peer Connections, which is in the special ed department. Students go in and help with the special ed kids. So I, I joined that and right away I just had bonds and friendships that I've never experienced. It's just completely different, you know, and there are a couple guys in those classrooms that were on my cross country team. I've learned to not really see them as students with special needs. They're, they're my friends, right? And just had a great time with them and really opened my eyes that there's 
there's more to sports than just, just being the best, right? It's all about the connections and having fun, coming together, um, whoever you are. Nick set a lot of goals in high school. Now, a new challenge lies ahead. The University of Michigan recruit hopes to hit the ground running once he lands on campus. Obviously, I want to have as much success as I can in college. I think it would start with qualifying to national meets and Big Tens and that type of thing, and then um, becoming a Big Ten champion and then working towards that, that national championship in college. And if there is an opportunity to run professionally, that would be my, my biggest goal probably. Nick Foster, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. All right, show your public expression of approval for Nick Foster. All right, guys, our fifth finalist is off the charts in the pool and the classroom from Holland West Ottawa High School, Derek Moss. Holland West Ottawa High School's Derek Moss is the number one ranked swimmer in the state, a four-time high school All-American who helped his team win the recent Division I state championship. In the classroom, Derek is ultra competitive, the definition of a scholar athlete. For example, Derek has already taken an online organic chemistry course at Yale. Where does this drive come from? When I was younger, it always was my older brother, Kyle, and he's swimming at Alabama right now. And so I'd always look at his times when he was my age and just shoot for those every year. And it's cool, I can be able to train with him this summer and at Alabama next year. That'll be a lot of fun. You've heard of the saying, it's all in the family. Well, Derek's hard work has paid off as he swam his way into the record books, beating his brother's pool record. This year, I broke his 200 IM record. Uh, he was there watching the meet on deck. That was awesome. And he was, he was definitely happy for me, though. Derek isn't just killing it as an athlete, but as a student. A weighted GPA of 456. He scored a 36 on the ACT and a 1580 on the SAT. He's a national AP scholar, a national merit scholar semifinalist, part of the SAT club, volunteers at Holland Hospital, where he works in the errand and escort service and volunteers as a timer at age group swim meets. I love timing because you can be on deck and talk to the swimmers before their races, you know, help pump them up. Many athletes have the dreams of one day being able to call themselves a professional. They work night and day on their craft. Well, how many high school athletes can actually say they got the chance to compete against future Olympians? It was incredible because at Winter Nationals, there were a lot of Olympians there. And so I was swimming in the same event as a couple Olympians and just seeing them race and warm up, like warming up in the same lane as them is a whole different experience. Derek Moss, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. I think we all say bravo for uh, Derek Moss. All right, our final male nominee is a four sport athlete who will be heading to Navy to run the rock and serve our country. For Madison Heights Bishop Foley High School, Kendall Taylor. It's not often that at a young age, we conclude we're here for a bigger purpose. Madison Heights Bishop Foley's Kendall Taylor will soon embark on a journey of service, self-sacrifice, and love of country at the Naval Academy. His high school athletics career is playing four sports, lacrosse all Catholic honors twice, all state in track and field, and football. He led the state in rushing for a while last season, and he recently became an individual state champion on the wrestling mat. Everything preparing him for what's next. I want to use my abilities to do something greater than myself. I want to, I want to help people. I don't want to use my abilities for like entertainment. Kendall will run the rock for the midshipmen. He carries a 3.5 GPA, scored a 24 on his ACT. Service is important as he's volunteered for groups like the Guardian Angels Summer Football Camp and the quote, 
Be the difference days at his school. We start coaching up the kids on how football works. We start teaching them the game of football, getting them better for like what they're gonna do in little leagues, trying to just trying to get them better. And also maybe like some of the kids, maybe they're older, like eighth, seventh, eighth grade, we'll start getting prepared for high school football as a way to like give back to the community that gave back to us. Anyone who's gone through the grind that is the individual wrestling state tournament knows that it takes tremendous focus and will to run through the gauntlet of the state's best in your division. My brother texts me, he, he texts me right before the state final. It's like, this is what you gotta do. You gotta want it, Every, anything can happen. He was like, literally, anything can happen. It's just who wants it more. And I was saying I want it more. I was believing that I want it more. But my semifinal match, I won it overtime. And this was against a guy who was 51 and 0. He was the regional champion of my regional, and I beat him. And I was like, I was just so happy. Boom, I snapped. You should have gone for the head. The snap, yep. Kendall Taylor, nominee for Male Athlete of the Year. All right, let's give kudos to Kendall Taylor. I told you it was an Avengers kind of night, so. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the finalist for the 2019 Michigan Male High School Athlete of the Year. And once again, these are all quality, quality young men. I just want us to, again, just show some love, some appreciation to these gentlemen in front of us. They represent our future, and it's a bright future. Thank you, guys, for all you've done. Okay, Jeff, the envelope, please. The tension in the room. Uh. All right, I want to tell you first that this champion won the award by one vote. This was the closest one that they've had here. So I want you to know again, this was extremely difficult to choose. But there can be only one winner. And the winner of this year's Detroit Athletic Club's 2019 Michigan Male High School Athlete of the Year Maybe we should all start snapping from Madison Heights, Bishop Foley, Kendall Taylor. Have a seat. Have a seat right there. Yeah, you can put that down. Yeah, you don't need to hold that. Ooh. So, how you doing? I'm doing great. This is this is this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little <laughs> surreal. Yeah. I want to up here uh, and again. All the nominees uh, tonight, outstanding. Uh, it's really difficult. Do we have any friends and family? With us tonight. Oh, uh, we got a we got a bunch. We got we got. Can you guys base. stand up? Your support system. Look at that. <laughs> got friends, family, coaches. My uh, two wrestling coaches. We got a bunch. We got yeah. a bunch here. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you know, it says a lot about you. Uh, who in your family has a military background? Uh, so my five uncles, my brother, my great grandpa, who's also here. Uh, he what, he was in World War II. He wow. was in the Navy also. My brother's in the Marine Corps, and my five uncles were on the Army. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So in ninth grade, you visit the Naval Academy. Yes. Uh, and I think you were just hooked, right? Because yep. we had a long talk about this in our interview. Um, talk about why that visit affected you so deeply. I mean, you were really only 14, 15 years old. It affected me deeply because it was like, 
uh, I was like watching videos how how the Naval Academy works and once I went there and just saw how it was like like saw the campus saw how beautiful it was um, how should I say this it was it was just it was it was like the snap it was like this it, it it's this uh, it was like this place is the place I want to go to this place is what I want to do with my, the rest of my life um, I just, words can't describe. You knew it. Yeah, I just automatically knew it. Like, That's awesome. Um, and this really is your dream, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we talked about it at length in the interviews to, to serve, protect others. You know, I mean, that really means a lot to you. Yes, it, it, it does. Where, where do you think that came from? Did somebody instill that in you? Um, it, use, it comes from my mom and my dad. Uh, my mom tries to help me with anything I want to do, and um, and I look up to my brother, who's also in the Marines, also serving our country, and he's talking about giving back, uh, like, and going back to my mom. Right. She's the one who gave birth to me. She made a selfless act to take care of me. Right. Like she didn't, she didn't have to give birth to me. I. I <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, okay. but yeah, yeah. I but get what you she, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. But yeah, if you you see what I mean, like, yeah. every every you gotta do you gotta have a self look at. I look up to my mom and my dad and my brother. Yeah, yeah, they're very important. Um, you didn't know anything about wrestling when you entered high school. Uh, you attended wrestling camp, and what was that like? Oh man, S met so many people, like. Uh, uh, one, I went to one in Mich uh, University of Michigan wrestling camp. Um, I met a friend named Luke Bishop. He he transferred our school this year, and he has been something. He he is crazy. Like I can't describe how crazy he is. Like he he loves wrestling. I love wrestling. We're just bumping heads, always trying to wrestle. We're always trying to wrestle each other. Like like out in the, out in the hallway, we're trying to wrestle. Out, out on the f football field, we're trying to wrestle. Before a lacrosse game, we're trying to wrestle. Just any anytime, any place, anywhere, we're trying to wrestle. It's you love wrestling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I get it. Uh, you wrestled at the 189 weight class in Division Three. You're the first individual wrestling state champion at Bishop Foley since 1971. Uh, it's one of the hardest things really anyone can do in high school sports. We kind of alluded to it in the story. Um, that tournament wears you down, mm. both physically and mentally. Talk about what winning that state title meant to you, uh, your confidence level, your belief in yourself. Um, going Honestly, going into it, I didn't have much, much confidence because out of regionals, I took fourth to, uh, in the first round, I lost to a guy that I beat. Uh, and it was just, I was like, oh my God. I was, I was, I was crying. Yeah. I did not expect this was going to happen during regionals. I did not expect this was going to happen at states. I, I just, it was. I I did not have that much confidence, but I was like, let's just let's just get through this. Let's one, take it one match at a time. See see how it goes. And my and as seen on the video, my brother texted me. He was like, you just got to want it. I'm like, I really do want this, but I don't know. I don't know, but I was like, all right, let's just take this one match at a time. Let's one match, first match, booms, one seven to four. Second match, I pinned the kid. I was like, oh crap, I can do this. Yeah. Third match, third match, I was like, all right, all right, I just gotta, just gotta get in the that flow. Was the Fifty-one and zero. Yeah, I got, I got, I got a snap. Right. I just got a snap, right. and I did. I beat a kid fifty and zero, and now he's fifty and. One. one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, uh, well, it's because yeah. he had And then the you won the championship. Yeah. They raise your arm just that moment. Whoo. Um, I, I think my dad was crying. I don't know. But I know I, I felt like, I felt like crying. Yeah. I was like, at four years trying to do this, like starting from freshman to senior year, it is, it is, it is wild. It was a wild ride. Yeah. It was full with ups and downs. It, oh, man. You played it, four sports at Bishop Foley. Football, wrestling, lacrosse, run track. Right now, lacrosse and track are mm -hmm. the same season. 
Uh, you told me that right after school you go to track practice, then you go to lacrosse practice. Uh, it's like 12 hours at school each day. Mm -hmm. um, then you go home and it's homework time. How do you get it all done? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. it it's like... Are you Superman or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just gotta, I, got, I, I try to just put my mind to it. I uh, just focus like, like when I get home, I'm like, all right, I got to do this stuff. I just get it done, get mo get stuff done, and especially with uh, I have I had a priv first hour, and I was like maybe if I'm like getting really tired, if this was like a really tough day at yeah. practice, I could probably hold some of that off for the priv in the morning. Yes, yeah. one of the nice things was, and you said you know kind of everything happens for a reason in our lives, and you told me that that kind of overload that you're experiencing actually prepares you for mm -hmm. what to expect at the Naval Academy. You said because they're gonna test you over and over to see exactly what you can handle. Yeah, they're, they're gonna like, for example, the workload that they're gonna put on it, it's gonna be constant, constant, constant. You just gotta pick your battles, kind of like how you're gonna be in the military. You're gonna have to pick your battles, gonna be have to like, all right, I gotta take this test, but I also have a lab. Which one am I better at doing? Am I better at studying for the test or I'm gonna do better at the lab? For me, it's gonna be used the lab, so I'm gonna try to do the best I can do in my lab and try to supplement something or get some help on the test. Right, 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 prepare you for it. Um, you're gonna play football, be a running back at the uh, Naval Academy. For those here in the audience who are lovers of traditions and rivalries, uh, you're gonna be in what many call the greatest rivalry and that uh, the greatest sporting event in the country, some say, and that is the Army versus Navy football game. Uh, what will that be like for you? Ooh, five uncles in the army. My brother's in the Marine Corps, and I'm, in, I'm uh, thinking about going Marine Corps, Navy SEALs, something like that. It's just going to be a rivalry between me and my inner family and outer family, which is, you know, yeah, the brotherhood. I want to watch the game now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be exciting. We're it's going to be a lot of ups and downs, but I'm hoping to more or less bring back beaten army right okay a couple more real quick um you guys had uh your be the difference days that we talked mm -hmm. about at uh, bishop foley you chose to fight blight right mm -hmm. um so what did you do and where did you go uh so we did it we did blight busters and what you do is you go out to like some of the uh, city of detroit okay. start cleaning up cleaning up um uh, like abandoned houses some stuff like that and you also um um how should I say this? Yeah, it's it's basically it's basically just cleaning up and helping helping out people, and yeah, doing what you can. Um, it's it's a it's it's also it also it helps as a leadership moment because I have to help the freshmen and some of the eighth graders that also come in. I have to tell them I have to teach them what to do how to do it correctly. What does winning this award mean to you? Ooh, it means a lot. It's, oh man, I can't, I, I ooh. <laughs> it, word, it just, it's, words can't, words can't express. It means so much to me. I did not know I was going to win this. It was, because all the, all the other athletes have so much talent. They're all amazing. Like, I'm just sitting there looking at, uh, looking at all the accolades, the other athletes, I'm like, Oh <laughs> crap! I was like, "Whoo, whoo, that." Yeah, that, that's like. They're whew, good. That's, they're that's, good. Yeah, no they're doubt. Amazing. Yeah, they all are. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Kendall Taylor. He is our 2019 male athlete of the year. Yep, yep. Take your award, yes, sir. I keep losing this. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's been a little bit of a long of an evening, but we appreciate you guys being here, and it was uh, uh, really wonderful. As we conclude our evening, I just want to get a few more rounds of applause. Uh, first, one more time for our world champion, Ben Wallace. And finally, it's become kind of a tradition here as we wrap up the DAC Awards. We call it the Unsung Hero. These uh, the most valuable people award. These winners don't get trophies or plaques. They surely don't get paid, but they are crucial to any young athlete's success. 
This award is given for standing in the rain at cross country and track meets, for getting up at four in the morning and driving to practice, for laboring to the baseball tournaments and football camps 300 miles away, for those AAU tournaments, uh, for helping our athletes learn the value of teamwork, sacrifice, dedication, communication, and family. Uh, this symbolic award goes to the people behind every student athlete. Those young athletes depend on your support, your inspiration, discipline, and of course, love for all that you've done to make them extraordinary people. For mom and dad, brothers and sisters, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, coaches, teammates, teachers, athletic directors, on behalf of young athletes everywhere, we applaud you. And if our nominees wouldn't mind standing up and maybe applauding for your family and friends that are here, that would be awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I invite every one of you to watch the highlights of tonight's awards show. It will air this Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on Fox Sports Detroit. Uh, I want to personally thank the Yellow Flag production team, Daniela Bruce, who is my co-host on the TV show, and she was the voice you heard on the female videos. I want to personally thank, of course, the Yellow Flag production team, all my boys, and of course, the DAC support team for another wonderful year and another amazing event. I invite you to join all our honorees in the adjacent room for dessert. Thank you for celebrating with us again and good night. <laughs>